Today we're going to review the American literary periods and their characteristics from the beginning points all the way up to the postmodern period. Let's start with the Puritan or colonial period from 1650 to 1750. First, it's historical context. Now, most of the Puritans believe that a person's fate is determined by God. You have a predestination. You were born already with your fate sealed. Now, all people are corrupt in their mind, and they must be saved by Christ. This is part of the fact of original sin in Christianity. And the covenant of grace and the covenant of works debate on and on. The idea of you're working for God and you're also working for man. You have to work hard here on the earth in order to show God that you will work hard in heaven. So when we look at the genres or styles that we have in the writing period of the Puritan and colonial times, you're going to see a lot of sermons, a lot of diaries, and a lot of personal narratives. Because we're just starting up our colonies, a lot of people are going to be writing down their personal narratives to send back home, to uh, make a sense of history. A lot of people are also going to keep diaries. This is one of the few forms of entertainment that the, the people who can write would have. And then, of course, the mostly educated people that you have in the Puritan times are going to be those who are going to be leading uh, the, the church and leading the government. So you're going to see a lot of sermons. And they write in the, what's called the plain style, where they're going to be using a lot of allusions to the Bible. They're also going to be using a lot of allusions to the Puritan ideals of God. Now, what effects or aspects do we find in the Puritan and colonial writings? Well, because you have a lot of personal narratives in history, because you have a lot of sermons, you're going to see that they are instructive in nature. We're supposed to be talking about the new world. We're supposed to be learning more about how we can perfect ourselves for God. It also reinforces the authority of the Bible and the church. The people who are educated enough to write down anything are going to be the ones who lead the church, who lead the government, and therefore you're going to notice the reinforcement of authority of the church. Now, some examples of our writings that you might see in your text or you might be looking for would be the Bradfords of Plymouth Plantation, one of the very first items that we have when they come to the Plymouth Colony in Massachusetts. Another Plymouth Colony one would be Rowlandson's A Narrative of the Captivity, where she is taken captive by the Native Americans. We also have Jonathan Edwards' Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, a great uh, sermon that we have that is going to remind us about how the authority of the church is just ever-present. And though it's not written during the Puritan times, a lot of times you'll see the crucible and the scarlet letter depict life during the time when Puritan theocracy prevailed in a lot of our texts. Moving on to the next age, that would be the Age of Reason or the Revolutionary Period in the United States. That would be from about 1750 to 1800. First, the historical context. This time tells readers how to interpret what they are reading, and they're meant to encourage Revolutionary War support. It is still quite instructive, but instead of being a sense of authority towards the church and towards God, now we're starting to instruct the values, what it means to be a colonial person, what it means to be an American, how you can perfect yourself, uh, and how you can perfect the sense of ideals that this new nation is starting to create. Because this is the age of reason and because it is the revolutionary period, the genres and styles of writing are going to be highly affected. First of all, because there's a war going on, you're going to have a lot of political pamphlets that are going to be for or against the war, for or against England, and all of the foibles that come with it. Because we're also starting to create our colonies and just starting to solidify where the colonies are and starting to our pioneering out west, you're going to see a lot of travel writing at this point. And instead of using the Puritan plain style, you're going to see a highly ornate style. Now you're starting to have people who are not exactly involved in the church who might also have been a plantation owner who have sent their children off to college. They're highly educated and they're going to write more in the European ornate style. 
And of course, a lot of it is going to be persuasive writing, whether it's persuasive for or against a war with England, whether it's persuasive on how to perfect yourself, whether it is persuasive to travel out west or to go pioneering and settle the west. There is a lot of persuasive writing in this period. Now, the effects are the aspects of the writing. While the writing is going to help grow our patriotism and might likely affect the war itself, it certainly instills pride that we are not colonists or Englishmen anymore, but the sense that we are Americans, that we are Virginians, that we are people from Massachusetts and from Pennsylvania. It creates a common agreement about issues. We might be from Virginia or South Carolina, we might be from Connecticut or Vermont, but we still have a same common agreement that we want to be free, that we want to create our own laws, that we want to own our own land. There's this national mission about the American character. There's a lot of people trying to define what it means to be an American at this time. Some of the examples you might see in a lot of texts would be the writings of Thomas Jefferson, maybe perhaps the writing of Thomas Paine, uh, a lot of people trying to convince us about the war. So of course, if you have the document of the Declaration of Independence or Thomas Paine's Common Sense. You might also be seeing some things from Benjamin Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac or perhaps from Franklin's Autobiography. And then we move on into the honest to goodness American literature, and that would be romanticism. By the time we get to 1800, at this point in time, America has set itself up as a nation unto itself, and we start seeing less about copying what the Europeans are writing and a bit more about our own American literature. But first, the historical context. Romanticism goes from about 1800, right around the time of the American Civil War in 1860, there's expansion of magazines and newspapers and book publishing. As people are moving out west, people want to have literature and people want to have an education to be able to read. So you're going to see newspapers and magazines and book publishing starting to move into these new areas as the people move. Of course, there's a lot of slavery debate going on between 1800 and 1860. While there was written into the Declaration um, about slavery and then especially into the Constitution of the United States about slavery not expanding, there is going to be a lot of debates about where slavery should and should not be. Also, the Industrial Revolution brings ideas that the old ways of doing things are now irrelevant. We want to be able to do things the American way. We don't want to be another little Europe. We want to be able to figure things out on our own. So what about the genres or styles of writing in the Romantic movements? Well, first you're going to be seeing character sketches. So we're going to start moving into more of our fictional experiences. They still feel quite nonfiction. And when you have character sketches, you start getting into frontier exploits. Character sketches and frontier exploits can have a nonfiction tangent to it, but you're also going to have a bit of exaggeration that goes on. Uh, we also have slave narratives. For example, you see Frederick Douglass on the right-hand side. You're going to have nonfiction narratives about people who are rising up against slavery or people who are freeing themselves from slavery. You also have a lot of poetry being written at this time period. Uh, a lot of people, especially over on the coastal areas of the East, um, a lot of poetry is being written about nature. A lot of poetry is being written about the sense of romanticism, about life. And lastly, short stories. Our short stories of fiction start becoming into our heyday here. This is the start of us creating an honest fiction movement in the United States. Well, what are the effects and aspects of reading the romantic movement? Well, you value feeling and intuition over the sense of reasoning. It's almost the opposite of our previous movement. Remember, the previous Revolutionary War movement is known as the Age of Reason. We're now doing the opposite. Instead of using our Age of Reason and logic, we want to value feelings and emotions. We want to value our intuition instead. We're journeying away from the corruption of civilization and limits of rational thought towards the integrity of nature, 
and the freedom of the imagination. Especially because we're in pioneering days, people are going towards the honesty and integrity of nature. We love nature, we want to be in nature, and the freedom of the imagination that comes along with it. This time period also helped instill proper gender behavior for men and women. Uh, at the time between 1800 and 1860, we are now establishing ourselves as a nation where we have a civilized uh, society. And so we're going to see that proper behavior for women is instilled in books and proper behavior for men, whether they're in the city or whether they're in the wilds, is instilled as well. Lastly, it also allows people to reimagine the American past. Uh, we are now moving past the generations that fought in the war or moving past generations that were first generation Americans who are not quite remembering how tough it was to start a colony. And so people are reimagining the past where George Washington can do no wrong, where Benjamin Franklin's event inventions were all completely American. Um, we do see even though these founding fathers and the Puritan fathers before them, they did do a lot of hard work, we give them sometimes more credit than we should. Some examples of writing from the Romantic movement, for example, for our short stories we're starting in our fiction, you might be looking at Washington Irving's Rip Van Winkle or his Legend of Sleepy Hollow. We also are looking at a lot of poetry. For example, William Cullen Bryant's Thanatopsis may also come in. Um, you also might have the poems of Walt Whitman, who you see on the right-hand side, or of Emily Dickinson, who we saw on the previous page. And we also might be seeing Dunbar's We Wear the Mask. Again, there's going to be a lot of slave narratives that are done as well. Now, at this time period, there's also going to be a breakaway movement in literature, and that's going to be transcendentalism, or the American Renaissance. And that's the second half of this movement. It's around 1840 to 1860. Now, what is a transcendentalist? For them, true reality is going to be spiritual. The emotions and intuition are key here. Now, this comes from the 18th century philosopher Immanuel Kant. Transcendentalists are idealists. They believe that they are part and particle of God, as to quote uh, 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 Emerson, who's in the middle of your American transcendentalist movement there. Now, he writes about self-reliance and the idea of individualisms, uh, where we're basically going to perfect ourselves, that we are completely in control of our lives and we're in control of our own fates. Now, with Emerson and his friend, Henry, Dave, uh, Her Henry David Thoreau, they're going to write a lot of information down as to how to perfect yourself, as how to live with nature, as how to become reliant only upon yourself. And they seek true beauty and understanding in life through nature. Now, a lot of what you're going to see in this particular genre or style is poetry. Emerson is known for some of his poems, uh, but he's also known for a lot of his narratives as well. You're going to see some short stories and novels starting to come through this particular period, and these are going to hold the reader's attention through dread of a series of terrible possibilities. You need to be self-reliant or else. You need to have a sense of utopianism in a community or else. Now, a lot of the nature that comes through this genre and style features dark forests, extreme vegetation, concealed ruins within horrific rooms, and depressed characters. So while you have this sense of idealism with the transcendentalists of Emerson and Thoreau, when we look at the short stories and novels, they get very dark and almost gothic-like. Moving on into our realist movement, just right before the American Civil War and then the post-war period itself, maybe around 1855-1860. The historical context. Well, the Civil War brings demand for a truer type of literature that does not idealize people or places. Uh, and of course, you're going to have a lot of battlefield uh, narratives and battlefield photography at this point. The genre and style of writing, you are going to continue writing your novels and short stories. Um, a lot of people are going to have maybe an exaggerated twist on the truth here. 
Uh, you have an objective narrator for the most point though, again where we have people writing a sense of narratives or diaries from the common soldier's point of view or from the view of somebody being left at home and worried about their loved ones off at the war. Because it is objective, it will not tell the reader how to interpret the story. They're just going to lay out the facts for you, be as it may, take the story for what it is. And the dialogue is starting to include voices from around the country. We're not going to quite state that dialect has now become a very moving force here, but you're going to start noticing northern and southern accents, northern and southern dialects, western pioneering accents here that are being written into the voice. Now the effect or aspects from this post-war period, we have a sense of social realism. The aims to change a specific social problem because of the reconstruction post-war period that is going on where we have to do rebuilding of our social and moral values, not to mention the building of the cities itself. As long as we're starting over again, we're looking at a sense of how do we clean up our values and how do we clean up our cities and towns. We're also going to look at the sense of aesthetic realism. Art that insists on detailing the world as one sees it. And again, you see from the post-war period, Jack London's White Fang here, where we have somebody going out into the wilds of nature, and you're going to see what nature really can be. It's quite opposite of what we saw in the Romantic movement, where we were going to go off into nature and enjoy it. Nature now can be cruel. Some of the examples that we have from the Civil War and post-war period might include the writings of Mark Twain, such as Huckleberry Finn that you see on the right-hand side. You might also have Stephen Crane, uh, and you might also have the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. So you're going to have, like, say, Mark Twain and Frederick Douglass writing nonfiction pieces like Mark Twain's Life on the Mississippi, but you're also going to have, for example, the modern novel The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn or Mark Twain's uh, other novels which are going to give you a sense of exaggerated realism uh, in, in the fiction movement. Like I said, you're also going to start seeing more dialects from different parts of the country, the north, south, east, and west, and they're going to be considered regional works. You're going to be reading The Awakening about women in the south. You're going to be reading Ethan Frome, which kind of gives us this western period uh, of a small town. My Antonia, which might be another modern novel that has been written in the post-war period. During this time period as well, we're also going to have regionalism. So as we start setting up between 1865 to 1915, the beginnings of the modern American novel, we're going to start looking at authors who would write a story about specific geographical areas. Now, writers in this time not only tried to show the region they wrote about to their readers, but they also made an attempt at a sophisticated sociological or anthropological treatment of the culture of the region. So when we look at the specific American region that they're talking about, the culture might include its languages, its customs, its beliefs, and of course, its history. And some of the authors of regionalism that you might see in your texts would include Willa Cather, William Faulkner, Kate Chopin, and Frank Norris. Now, naturalism is going to happen around the 1890s to the 1950s, so it's still in that realistic post-war movement, but it also starts moving into our modern period. Now, the naturalist movement trends rather than a movement. It's not formalized or dominated by the influence of a single writer. It is a more extreme, intensified version of realism, and it shows unpleasant and ugly, shocking aspects of life. You get an objective picture of a reality with a scientific detachment to it. So here, in a sense of naturalism, your author is going to be writing as if there is pessimism, there is no free will, and you have this sense of determinism where man's life is dominated by the forces he cannot control. His biological instincts and the social environment are going to be the controlling forces. We begin to see a bit of the modern movement's disillusionment, where we have this sense of the American dream, the dream of success, is now collapsing uh, as the agrarian myth of the United States is collapsing. 
A lot of naturalists are also going to give us the struggle of an individual who's trying to adapt to their environment. You're going to be seeing the struggle of an individual out in nature, struggling to adapt to nature. You're going to see the struggle of an individual trying to adapt to this, the big city and all of its foibles for the first time. Now, society is something stable and its predictability allowed one to present a universal human situation through an accurate representation. But again, it is given just as an accurate representation. There's a scientific detachment to this. And lastly, you do have to have a bit of faith in something. So you have faith that society at least is stable. You understand the society and we're going to see a bit of art as well. But then that now moves us into the modern movements. From about 1900 to 1950, we're now in the modern American period. The historical context. Well, writers begin to reflect the ideas of Darwin, that whole survival of the fittest, where we have evolved from other species. You're also going to see a lot of writing reflect Karl Marx, how money and class structure will actually control a nation. And Sigmund Freud is also in this historical context where we're looking at the power of the subconscious. Because our industrial period has now been around for a couple of generations, there's now going to be overwhelming technological changes in the 20th century. Between 1900 and 1950, America has now become a superpower and you're going to see the technology is coming out of America as a nation first for the rest of the world to see. We also start seeing the rise of youth culture. That'll come even better in the postmodern movement, but this is the first time now where we start seeing the culture and societies of, of the youth where they're no longer being involved so much in working, but now they are getting a full high school education, more are going off to college, and a lot of them are finding more leisure time. The modern movement, of course, is also going to be affected by World War I, World War II, and the Great Depression. And so a lot of the modern American uh, genre is going to be affected by those three events as well. Now when we get to the modern period, everything is on the table for writing. We're not only going to see novels, but now we're going to see great American plays. We're going to see a great resurgence of poetry. Whitman and Dickinson die in the late 19th century, uh, Whitman around 1900, and so poetry all of a sudden has a great resurgence that is going to be influenced by these two writers. We also see a sense of highly experimental writing as writers are starting to seek their own unique style. Because of the regionalists in the previous period were starting to create novels that were specific to their own region of America, now anything goes. And lastly, you're also going to see the use of interior monologue and stream of consciousness with the idea of classicism and with the idea of Sigmund Freud and the subconscious, a lot of what we've been reading about in philosophy is going to come into our American plays and novels as well. Well, what are the effects and aspects of the modern literature movement? Well, we are much again in the pursuit of the American dream. We are in every single period, but this is the first time the modern movement in which the American dream kind of seems to be on hold with World War I, the Great Depression, and World War II all happening in this period, a lot of people are starting to wonder if that idea of success, if the American dream is even attainable for everyone. Even though we're having troubles getting it ourselves, we still have that sense of admiration for America as a land of Eden where the streets are paved with gold. This is one of the periods where we see the highest amount of immigration coming into America. And because of that, you're also going to see a sense of optimism being written. And like we had 100 years previously, once again, America is going to reflect the importance of individualism and self-reliance in its writing. Well, what are some examples? And there are several examples in this movement, but some of them that you might see in text would certainly be F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. Uh, you're also going to see Ian Rand's Anthem as we start setting up our sense of sci-fi and fantasy for, for the ages. 
We have a lot of poetry coming at this time, people who are influenced by Whitman and Dickinson, uh, the poetry of Jeffers, uh, William Carus Williams, E.E. E. Cummings, uh, we're going to have Robert Frost, Eliot, Sandberg, Pound, Robinson, Stevens. There's there's a lot of different types of poetry here, and it's kind of hard to show a William Carlos Williams next to an E.E. E. Cummings next to a Robert Frost. They're all unique and different and yet uniquely American. The same goes for the short stories and novels of Steinbeck, Hemingway, Thurber, Welty, Faulkner. A lot of these are writing the great American novels and at the same time writing as regionally as possible. Hemingway is going to be writing about the northern parts of America because he's originally from Illinois and spent a lot of time in Michigan, spent a lot of time in Montana. But he's also going to be writing European novels. Um, you're going to have F. Scott Fitzgerald write about the East and the Great Gatsby, but he reflects that his novel is really a, a novel about the West after all. And Faulkner is going to, William Faulkner is going to be writing about his home state of Mississippi. Um, and so a lot of times, even though these are novels written with a classic American, almost international flair, they still have a lot of regionalism in them. And finally, we see the great American plays finally taking prominence. The idea of Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun, or Wright's Native Son, uh, where we have an outgrowth of the Harlem Renaissance from the 1920s and 30s. We see then in the second generation with A Raisin in the Sun and Wright's Native Son, the idea of the African American moving up north or moving out east and finally getting their due. They're going to work hard in order to pursue their American dream. We're also going to see Arthur Miller's The Death of a Salesman and other Miller plays um, where we might consider them to be almost postmodern, where we're starting to see uh, a lot of the philosophy of Marx or of Freud, the self-consciousness uh, of our, uh, of our uh, actors uh, and portraying the different characters on stage, um, how they will have their great highs and their great downfalls. And so because of that, it's almost fairly new. Some might even consider Arthur Miller to be postmodern, post-1950. Now, there's other periods within this time period. Uh, parallel to modernism is going to be the Harlem Renaissance. That's around the 1920s, right after World War I and right before the Great Depression. You have this mass African-American migration to northern urban centers. So we're not only going to see them over in the east uh, in Philadelphia and in New York, but you're also going to see them coming to Chicago and St. Louis. Now, African Americans have more access to media and publishing outlets after they move north. They're more, they have more ability to write in these urban centers. Now, the genre or styles that they have, they have allusions to their past with the ideas of African-American spirituals, and they'll use the structure of blues songs in their poetry, that sense of repetition and that sense of rhythm. You're also going to see superficial stereotypes revealed to be complex characters. They're going to start writing the way American readers would, would know, uh, with very simple superficial stereotypes of their characters, and then they're going to reveal them as being just as complex as any other, uh, any other character you might be reading in a modern novel. The effect or aspects of the Harlem Renaissance, it gives birth to gospel music. We take a little bit of jazz and the blues and turn it into poetry and bring the sense of, of music together. Everything then starts in the sense of gospel music. Blues and jazz are going to be transmitted across America via radio and phonographs. So they brought their ideas or their sense of cultures into these urban centers where they're able to publish. And now the most aspects even though nowadays we read a lot of the poetry, the plays, the short stories of this period, they didn't go that far past the urban centers at the time. But what did in the 1920s was gospel music, blues, and jazz. Some of the examples of what we might read today from the Harlem Renaissance might be the essays and poetry of W.E.B. Du Bois, the poetry of McKay, Toomer, and Cullet, the poetry and short stories and novels of Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes, two of the great and prolific authors of the movement. 
And then, of course, the novels, maybe perhaps you might be reading from Their Eyes Were Watching God. Finally, we're going to cover postmodernism by 1950 to probably around September 11th, 2001, but we'll count that as the present. Uh, we'll have post-World War II prosperity. Now that we have World War II done, we have the Great Depression out of the way, now you're going to start seeing America as a superpower hit home, not only in our urban centers, but in our subdivisions, in our towns. Media culture is going to interpret the values. Not only did we have the great age of movies coming in the previous movement, but now by 1950, there's TVs that are coming into everybody's home. And so media culture is going to be shown every single night in the home. There still is that sense of disillusionment that is coming over from the American modern movement where not everybody could possibly have the American dream of success. There's also resistance to easily recognizable themes or morals in a story. Before we had superficial or stereotypical characters, you kind of knew where the ending was going. Now there's this resist resistance to write those easily recognizable themes. There's now a resistance to say there has to be a moral to the story. They also insist that values are not permanent but maybe perhaps a historical value or maybe perhaps just a local value. In other words, your characters are deeply flawed. The genres or styles that we see in postmodernism, just like you saw in the American movement, you're going to have everything. We mix fantasy with nonfiction now. Before this period, fantasy and sci-fi stayed fantasy and sci-fi, nonfiction stayed nonfiction. But now we're going to start blurring the lines of reality for the reader. We're also going to see some stories where there are no heroes. Everybody has a flaw. Nobody's the quote unquote good guy. You don't have stereotypes. There's concern with the individual in isolation. Before we talked about self-reliance and individualism, the idea of the individual was positive. And we can still have that sense even today in postmodernism, but there could also be a concern with individuals and how isolated they're making themselves. Now, social issues come as writers align with feminist and ethnic groups. We're finally going to see that it doesn't matter what ethnic background you're from. It doesn't matter if you're male or female or if you are neither. Uh, now we're going to start seeing those writers are going to have just as much of an equal prosperity as any other author. A lot of times people look at postmodernism as a humorless time period because, again, our characters are deeply flawed. Uh, we are also going to have that sense of metafiction coming in where fiction basically looks like a sense of reality. I mean, this is the time period where we start just getting into our reality TV shows on TV where, yes, it's reality, but we're starting to script it. A lot of your genres are going to be written in the present tense, and we're going to be seeing a lot of narratives. Character is king in the postmodern movement. If you're going to turn into a television show week after week, you want to be able to see what's going to happen next to the character. You're not so much concerned about a theme. You're not so much concerned about the plot line. You want to know what's happening to that character week after week. That's going to continue on into our uh, contemporary movement today, where you might be sitting down and watching a couple of seasons of a TV show because you want to see how that character is going to grow. Some examples of the postmodern movement, uh, Mahler's The Naked and the Dead and the Executioner's Song. A lot of feminist and social issue poets such as Pl Sylvia Plath, uh, Rich, Sexton, Levertrov, uh, Baraka, Cleaver, uh, Toni Morrison, uh, Walker, Giovanni, uh, a lot of feminist and a lot of ethnic writers finally get their heyday. They can finally come and be uh, the writers that we would have hoped in America we could have always had. Now, again, we talked about Arthur Miller's Death of the Salesman in previous modern movements, but a lot of people might consider Arthur Miller's writing more postmodern. You might also be seeing a lot of metafiction or a lot of realistic fiction. We look at perhaps, say, Truman Capote's In Cold Blood or Lawrence and Lee's Inherit the Wind. 
Uh, the stories of Kurt Vonnegut as well. Uh, we also have J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye that a lot of people are going to look at as a different type of social issue movement where teenagers are going to be talking about the lack of social values and morals. We will have the beat poets of the 1950s and 60s, such as Jack Kerouac. We also have Allen Ginsberg. We've got Burroughs. And then, of course, we have a lot of our social issues coming into our sci-fi and fantasy. Um, we have Casey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, where we start questioning our sanity and our humanity. And that is it for our different parts of American literature. If you liked what you saw here for your review, please let me know in the comments if there's anything else you'd like me to cover, if you'd like me to cover contemporary movements. And as always, I'd wish if you, I'd be happy if you'd subscribe.